Crush and Lobo, issues number one through eight, review arc, written by Mariko Tamaki, pencils and inks by Amake Nahufan, I think that's how you pronounce his name, uh, colors by Tamara Von Billion. DC Comics is the publisher. This came out from July 1st, 2021 to January 4th, 2022. DC Comics, a founding titan of the industry that gave us our heroes and entertained us for generations, and hopefully generations to come. And though we may look fondly through our nostalgia glasses about the past and how the current iteration of stories at the time of this recording just isn't up to snuff, we have to remember that even during the golden and silver ages of comics, there were plenty of duds. In about 80 years of comics, TV shows, cartoons, and movies, there are only dozens of stories per hero that stand out positively through the test of time. So what does this have to do with Crush and Lobo? Let's do the YouTube thing, beat the algorithm to help a channel out, and here we go. Now, I have done an initial impression on this comic, issue number one. If you want to check that out, please do, but not necessary for this video. Crush, otherwise known as Ziomara Roja, is the daughter of Lobos, raised by illegal migrant workers, turned hero after joining the Teen Titans that was led by Damian Wayne, takes center stage in this series. I happen to really like the look of this character. Tough Biker Girl is somewhat not popular in the current DC lineup, or at least it's not the norm, and it makes her distinct, stand out, and a breath of fresh air. That being said, her being part of the LGBT community, her being gritty, her being part of the gray area of herodom, well, let's just say that has been the superhero shtick for pretty much all of US comics. The first eight issues of this series is a mixed bag, though generally having favorable reviews on Comixology, not sponsored by the way. I have to say that the sample size of reviewers is somewhat lacking. At the time of this recording, 7 out of 8 issues had ratings. It has an average of 38 reviewers per comic. It is skewed right due to the large number of reviews being on the first issue, which was 70. But in a market where the number of books sold reach in the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, 70 is minuscule, and generally with a 5 star review and with a small sample size, it is clear that the reviews alone aren't final in determining how good this series is. Since literature, and comics are literature, is a fairly subjective medium and thus determining the final worth will be different per different reader. And I hope that I will shed an objective light and give this a fair shake, as they say. Okay, so I'm going to give a quick summary for every issue, and, you know, needless to say, there's going to be spoilers here, so if you don't want to watch it, don't watch it. And I will try to be as terse as possible. Issue number one, 21 pages of story. We open to Crush fighting aliens, a discount Krang, to become late to her girlfriend's birthday party, to which Crush is overwhelmed by meeting the parents and accidentally causing a toxic gas to be released, thus ruining the party. Crush and her girlfriend take a break, or at least break up from Crush's point of view. Red Arrow makes a cameo, encouraging Crush to meet her biological dad, Lobo, citing the number of coffee mugs as a sign of running away and also relating it to the girlfriend issue. Crush steals a spaceship to go to space prison where Lobo is. We end with Lobo saying he is looking forward to meeting his daughter. Issue number two, which is 22 pages, Crush and her stolen, not that it matters, spaceship, still not over the breakup as evidenced by the first meet flashback, stops for coffee in space. Meets up with Discount Krang, apparently this alien is good at making coffee. Um, this Discount Krang, along with a couple of flunkies, board the spaceship, they fight, spaceship blows up mid-trek, Crush survives. We have another flashback that shows, you know, the relationship issues and Crush space hitchhikes to space prison. Issue number three, 20 pages. We open to group therapy. A giant mantis talks about his issues and hugs Lobo. We get another flashback to Crush's relationship issues of missing the meet the parents dinner before we get the sit down heart to heart between Crush and Lobo, which turns out to be a trap. Like we didn't see it coming. 
because Crush gets captured by the prison because she has Lobo's identifier in this high-tech space prison. Thus, she ends up in prison because the space prison robots think she's Lobo. And I'll be honest, this turned me away from the series a bit. And a bookend joke, the giant mantis in the beginning has his head bitten off by his son, who Crush met in the lobby. Issue number 4, 21 pages. Crush is in prison doing prison cliches. Working out, fights, painting for therapy. Apparently she is into painting. Um, also, somehow the advanced space prison still doesn't realize that Crush isn't Lobo. Because robots be dumb. She also figured out in group therapy that Lobo tricked her. And not the first group therapy either. And only after a fist fight with the biggest and baddest inmate, again, cliche, I know, in which she is sent to the prison hospital, does this space prison realize she is not her dad. Because, you know, anatomy. So, the prison and Crush make a deal. There is a countdown to capture Lobo, or Crush goes boom. Meanwhile, all this is going on, Lobo is doing what Lobo does on the outside, causing chaos. Issue number 5, 19 pages. This is a montage of tracking to find Lobo, and we see the kind of problems that he causes. Crush picks up some lizards, meets Lobo's main current, Squeeze, who lies to Crush about his location. This is interspersed with moments of Crush and her girlfriend, you know, the flashbacks. And Crush has been ignoring texts from her girlfriend. Turns out Lobo is in Space Vegas, and you know, all this interspersed with deep introspection by Crush's narration. Issue number 6, 21 pages. Crush is looking for Lobo in Space Vegas, goes on a blind date with an alien, because she might die, because the countdown on her wrist, and goes on one crazy date that wasn't so crazy. Beats up a stand-up comic in which her date leaves because the alien saw red flags. Though, does every alien have to have superpowers? I mean... Couldn't they just use this as a nice point to showcase how similar Crush is to Lobo by showing how much she enjoys the violence? Either way, we have fourth wall break jokes, time is running out, and she hatches a plan with the lizards who were basically partying while all this was going on. Issue number 7, 22 pages. A father-daughter knockdown brawl as described in the description of Comixology. This is not. It's a chase sequence, a naked Lobo chase sequence, which leads to Lobo being tricked by Crushed, who dressed up as a showgirl. A small fight occurs. The lizards help capture Lobo since one of them had paralytic venom and bites him. And the time was about to run out by the time Crush delivers Lobo. Cliche again. And guess what? It's another trap set by the prison. Number 8, 22 pages. It turns out that this was an, an elaborate scheme slash hoax for Crush to capture Lobo as part of a plot to gather data on them to help write a book to sell to the universe. Crush beats up the Warden, who we just meet in person now, who apparently planned this entire thing, helps Lobo escape. They beat up the Warden, which was mostly censored, and I realized that was a joke, but a missed opportunity for some sweet action scenes. And there may be hope between Crush and her girlfriend who didn't want to break up. Also, the prison wants Lobo back again. So Crush is hired by that same prison that captured her to capture him again. And the discount Krang, we see him again and he's at the coffee shop, wants revenge on her. Because apparently he also has universe conquering plans. Now the, you know, my thoughts part. Um, okay, so we're on the same page here. So I said I would be terse, and that being said, I didn't really leave out anything you'll miss. I don't have an issue with the art. Let's just be clear about that, you know? Let me be clear. It's the typical comic book style. I thought it somewhat lacked impact and key moments of action and emotion, but that's just me. The pacing, however, is less subjective, and it was not that great we jump from one scene to the next with only the thin plot line holding it all together and at a breakneck speed there was no build of tension for the romance or the action or the mystery part and i don't know if this is asking too much of mariko tamaki a veteran of the industry and experienced writer on multiple books on both 
Marvel and DC, the most recent work gathered some controversy, like I Am Not Starfire, to which at the time of this recording has 26 reviews and averages around 4 stars on Comixology, but I would expect a veteran to have some better pacing. This much is clear from the writing in the books. This was supposed to be a story that juxtaposes Crush and Lobo, and with a total of 168 pages worth of comic book stuff, that's not like the ads and everything, the actual comic book story panels, that is plenty of real estate to tell that kind of story with nuance. But all these elements have been crammed into the series. Crush's relationship issues with her girlfriend, Crush's issues with her dad, Crush and Discount Krang, who is her nemesis. I guess for this run, Crush and her own personal issues. Crush, the bounty hunter, TikTok of the bomb on the wrist clock, and it also turned out to be not a bomb, the shady space prison and all the jokes. All of that while having to put your usual superhero action shtick as required for the superhero genre. If that sounds like a lot, that's because it is. Now, I'm not going to say that it is impossible to balance all these elements in a story and keep the pacing in a way that doesn't feel like it's going at a breakneck speed. But it is safe to say that in this series of comic books, it did not happen. Mariko Tamaki is familiar with your comic book tropes and cliches. This much is true. But trying to use every single tool in the comic book writing toolbox works against this series. Simplicity would have worked more to... Mariko Tamaki's advantage here. If she wanted to focus on Crush's relationship with her girlfriend, um, what's her name? Katie. That would have been fine. If she wanted to focus solely on Crush's issue with Lobo, that would have been fine too. And considering that Lobo beat her to a buddy pulp in the Teen Titans, um, that would have been a great place to build off of. If she wanted to keep the light comedic tone for most of the series, it is doable, but to be honest, there was no focus to that there because the pace went at a breakneck speed. You couldn't focus on any of that. And speaking of tone, um, there was nothing wrong with having a comedic tone throughout the series. Some of the most successful comic books or manga are generally comedic. But when things get serious, you finish the serious before you crack the jokes. Uh, but the light comedic tone made it difficult to achieve any sort of tension or weight for the main character. It's like, oh hey, I'm sorry for almost killing everybody at your birthday party, girlfriend. You know, joke there, right? Hey, I got trapped by my deadbeat of a dad. Joke there. Naked Lobo chasing. I guess that's the cho um, pff, joke. Beating up the tentacle monster as your running gag. Though you couldn't really tell from the facial expressions that it was supposed to be a joke but not dissing the artist but the composition really didn't fit the tone in which the story was told so and this is consistent throughout the eight issues so i have to assume that this was done on purpose i don't know why though and furthermore there is no setup and payoff in this series Relationship issues with Katie? Unresolved. Shady Prison? Still around. Lobo? Still going to chase him. Discount Krang? Mad at Crush because she beat him up and... Yeah. But why does any of this matter? Nothing really changed. In reading this series, the question kept popping up in my mind. Why does this matter to Crush? Why should I care? Where's the tension? The answer is I don't care. Because there is none. Like, take the example with the issue with Crush has with Lobo. As mentioned before, he almost did kill her while she was with the Titans. And, you know, what about Crush has issues that led to unresolved issues with Lobo? The absent father whose only interaction with her was beating her to a pulp after she's basically grown up. And, and somehow that she needed closure about it and because it relates to somehow the way that she interacts with her girlfriend i mean why is this even connected and has it even been shown the answer is no and somehow after beating up the space prison warden and a bunch of prison robots she and lobo reach some sort of understanding in that they're fine with killing each other because they're sarzanians or zarnians or however you pronounce it i mean isn't that a little bit space racist? Or 
how about Fresh and Katie? I assume that this is the other focus of the story because we're constantly shown these flashbacks of their relationship, you know. But that being said, without any sort of sense of time that has passed or anything, we don't really know how much Crush or Katie is invested into the relationship. Are they just going through the motions or is this something more, right? And because of that, it makes those scenes where we do the flashbacks pretty, you know, impactless. You know, we know that Katie is texting Crush a lot somehow in space, but, you know, at the end, if you... Because nothing really changed, Crush may go back to her, but nothing changed. They're still apart, and at the end of this arc, makes you kind of wonder, why did we even need the Katie part? If you took out all the scenes that had, you know, Katie and that Catered it to some more of the you know superhero comic book action it probably would have improved the lobo and crush part of the story or if she wanted to focus on the relationship crush has with katie then show how lobo and crush has that you know you're not the same or you are the same and crush is like i'm not my dad you know angle right but like i said this series tried to do one of everything and kind of missed the mark on all of it and overall, there's just no build to anything. And because of that, this series suffers in quality, as far as the story is concerned. I mean, there are good ideas here, but they have to be polished, and there's no polish here. Plain and simple, it's way too reliant on cliches and tropes and forgets about the character building, because it really isn't there. Nothing changed from Katie and Crush within these eight comics. They are still separated. Crush and Lobo. Lobo is still going to kill Crush, and Crush always thought that Lobo was trash. That part hasn't changed, right? Um, do they respect one each other? Maybe, kind of, I don't know. Probably not. Who knows if Lobo actually respects anyone. Um, so the only thing that has changed by the end of this arc is that Crush is going to go hunt Lobo for a living with some space lizards because she is going to get paid by the prison that captured her in the first place for material for selling books, you know, in space. You know, I really hate that I sound so negative. I really do. I don't enjoy it. Um, and even more so because I really like the look of this character. She's a badass tough girl. What is there not to like about her? Not really. But clearly whoever approved this character didn't get past the look of her. And I hate, you know, that whole hot takes and, you know, these criticisms that aren't really criticisms because they're bad faith criticisms and they don't even offer a way to like, oh, hey, it would have been better if you did this, right? They're just simply, this is bad. You have to agree with me. This is bad. I mean, how does this help your medium, right? It, it doesn't. If you like this medium, you would offer a criticism and then give something to back it up. If not, then, you know, your criticism sucks. So here are the parts that I feel could have been explored to the betterment of this character. First of all, she was raised by Mexican parents. I think they were either illegals or migrant workers, who named her Ziomara Rojas. So why doesn't she speak any Spanish? No Dios mío? No que? Okay. No naughty Spanish language exclamations? No Spanish mannerisms at all? I mean, you know, a simple ba, ba. You know, simple language insertions like that would have done wonders in adding some layer to this character. Uh, the punk biker rocker look is fine. After all, this is the daughter of Lobo here. But they couldn't add any Mexican cultural references here. I mean, maybe a Day of the Dead skull if you want to be obvious. Or some face paint or some Mexican pop culture stuff. I don't know, something like that. Or tattoos, something, right? Um, and, oh, the food could have done a big part, because food is a big part of any culture. Mexico is not excluded from this. So, like, how is she with spicy food, right? Uh, does she only prefer Mexican queso on her type tacos? Uh, no, all we get is that she likes coffee, because, you know, it's relatable. Everybody loves coffee, right? Um, does she have a softer side? Don't know. I mean, we are shown that she paints in prison and got a paint set from Katie, but we don't see her show any artistic inclination outside of that, like in the background, right? In her apartment or anything. Or all we get, because all we get right is that she is strong and tough, right? 
And what do we know about her relationship with our adoptive parents? Like, literally, her origin in this is the same as Bruce Timm's God and Monsters Superman. You know, evil, you know, dad, raised by migrants. Uh, imagine if they went with the whole luchador route, you know. Again, I know it's cliche, but considering that there's a lot of wrestling fans, and that gives it a lot more dynamic to play off of, and it would certainly make it fun. How would our adoptive parents feel about Crush being part of the LGBT, right? Because that's never not an issue in Mexican culture. Um, how would Lobo, right? Is Lobo going to be pro progressive and accepting about the whole LGBT relationship, or would he be oddly conservatively prudish about it? Who knows? Right, but all these could have been explored, but was not. There's plenty more. Now, Mariko is a writer for Detective Comics, but if this is the kind of work that she is writing and DC is okay with publishing, is it really any wonder that manga outsells US comics in the United States? Does that sound insulting? It does, but it still stands. You want a story involving struggles of young women? There are plenty to choose from in manga, right? Um, there's one called Art, about a young woman trying to be an artist during the Renaissance. The Apothecary Diaries is a detective story set in Imperial China, where the main character, Mao, is the daughter of a red light district doctor. Thus, she is smart, curious, and in the non-normative, but in the good way, right? the admirable way uh, you want LGBT rep uh, there is the genres called yaoi and yuri basically entire genres based on that subject matter you ever read girlfriends I highly recommend it uh, Ichi a blind woman swordsman play on Zato Ichi very good highly recommended Sailor Moon magical girl Nanoha both about magic power transforming superheroines a certain scientific railgun. You know, the fact that there is this huge range in depictions of strong female types, you know, it is somewhat baffling that in the United States comic books, they keep it so narrow and superficial. I mean, seriously, the United States comics can compete with manga, but that just means that they have to polish their work to the same degree. And this one simply isn't as polished as the writer or editor or even the industry thinks it is like i said i don't really have a problem with the art i really like it but you know that's just a matter of taste because i don't love it right all i can say that it was competent but most likely held back by the story thank you for watching this video up to this point this one has been a long one but that being said it is my thoughts on Crush and Lobo. I do hope that you did make it this far. And if you didn't, you know, I got to work on my stuff, right? Because you have to keep polishing your work. That being said, I hope you are having a good day, good evening, and all that fun stuff. Make sure you do the algorithm-y stuff to help the channel out. Thank you again, and ciao, everybody.